It looks like the end of a shift. Two miners, two butties, walking home to terraced houses, just as countless thousands like them have done before. Only now in the Ronda, with no working pits left, they're walking to out of the past, out of time. As working miners, they too are now just trace memories of a vanished age. Chroniclers of their own lives, in their own lives, and of the story of Ronda's people. The first day you start in the ground, the walk, the dust, the noise, and the men's sweat, and the, and the humour, and the joking, and all these things stay in your mind. And um, looking back at it, okay, perhaps, uh, perhaps could have got better, perhaps you could have done a lot better, you know, but nevertheless, I mean, the men I work with, if I had my time over again, I would, wouldn't hesitate, I'd do the same thing again, you know. If you look in uh, at traces in this valley behind us now of uh, what this, you know, uh, where industry was, you won't find a lot because it's all been landscaped and terraced, but if you look deep into this valley, I'm talking quarter mile underground, that's where the Ronda has been, uh, you know, raped sort of thing, you know, uh, the guts have been worked out of this valley, you know. That's where all the work was done in around there, quarter mile underground. Coal mining, first in levels dug into the hillside, later in deep sunk pits, brought hordes into these valleys a century ago. But above all those new Ronda people, on the mountain plateaus, were already echoes of a much earlier people, one whose Iron Age existence, centuries old and almost unimaginable to us now, is still evoked by these ruined hillside forts, by these mossy stones. And their voices sometimes drift in the wind amongst the mountain grasses. A prehistory, a time before coal, as well as a time after coal. We know what Ronda looked like just before the coal rush began. Travellers talk of alpine scenery, of richly wooded slopes and tumbling glass rivers. The few hundred who lived on the slopes above the streams kept sheep, some cattle, worked as craftsmen, farmed above the valley bottom. This unexpected, hidden Ronda still lingers too, at Fanandoin, amongst the steep streets of Clydach Vale. Well, it was built in the 17th century, and the people that lived here were serfs, which meant that they lived all in the one roof with the animals. They went through from the, from the big room to the animals and fed them, and the, the fireplace was at the side of the, where they walked through, so they kept themselves warm and they kept the animals warm and there was no light of any kind. So there, there were no windows in the house because there was a tax on light. And so the only light they had was when they opened their front door. The stairs are stone and the only access is to go, uh, for furniture to go up is through the roof in the big room. Land to live on became land to live by. They bought the land to sink the colliery and in order for the men to find place to live they had to build houses so they sold them the land. It was in the Lower Ronda at Dinas 150 years ago that the coal bonanza really began. It is the suddenness of the growth that still stuns. An immemorial landscape was now swiftly honeycombed with tunnels and shafts, rifted by pickaxes and dotted about with the rap and spin of the pithead wheel. By the end of the last century, the first phase of expansion was almost complete, and every valley township 
from Trihava to Blind Ronda, from Porth to Mardi, were settled around collieries, the names of whose coal seams were as familiar as family names. Chimneys, hooters, steam. All declared the Ronda valleys as the greatest steam coal valleys the world had ever seen. Railways rattled day and night to carry the coal to the ports of Cardiff and Barry, and hence across the globe, wherever the British Empire chose to raise steam. Underground, the human cost was proving just as prodigious. When pits are first sunk in the Ronda, and the first uh, drum of coal came out of the Ronda in 1812, when Napoleon was retreating from Moscow, kids were working in conditions like this. At air doors. Air doors are there because they're there to deflect the air to the place where it's needed most. And that's the coal face, of course. Kids as young as seven and eight year old came down the pit with something like this. Not as refined as this, as a matter of fact. The first Davy lamps. Uh, were perfected very back in the beginning of the century and that's what they used these dairy lamps for was to sit there at the door waiting for the horse to come along with an empty or a full drum of coal of course responsible to make sure that that air door or the ventilation doors were closed at all times. Children ill-educated, lacking in nourishment, stunted growth, children that would be, were able to record to the teachers presumably or chapels that they came underground and they were burnt. They took that for granted that they were going to get burnt. So children recorded history a long time away, a long time back in the beginning of the Ronda, that they were burnt in atmospheres that were absolutely unbe unbelievable and atrocious. Ronda attracted capital and labour in equal measure. Coal owners, like the Scotsman Archibald Hood, were something more than industrial titans. So in a pier, the magpie's nest, was blackened into modern life by Hood's Scotch colliery. And the settlement was then expanded and filled with workers who came to Wales for his Glamorgan colliery workings. This life was never really made rural again, even by the mansion set in the trees at Glyn Cornell. But Ronda's industrial life was still rooted in a Welsh culture. My family uh, came to the Ronda about the middle of the, uh, of the last century. Uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was a builder and uh, he was following the boom uh, in the mining industry and he came from West Wales into the Swansea Valley, then uh, came to Aberdeer and then crossed to the Ronda Vach, building houses uh, all the way, and then he came to, uh, to Truoki. But uh, my grandmother um, came from the Merthyr area, and uh, in the, the last century, most of the people, the second half of the last century, came into the Ronda, they were Welsh-born. As late as the 1850s, there were less than a thousand inhabitants in the Ronda. Within 60 years, there would be 150 times that number. They came from far as well as near. Workers from the rest of Britain and beyond, attracted by this thriving world. Well, my mother was a Belgian. She came over years ago with her stepfather to open a bracky shop, the old Italian cafes. And uh, her mother, with her mother, her mother died, so she went back to Belgium. Uh, and she was in Belgium then during the First World War. Well, her brother, um, older than her, came back then after the war to take over the bracky shop and brought my mother back with her. And of course, in those days, all the footballers, all the young men used to go in these bracky shops. He met my mother, and that's it. They got married, and <laughs> I'm the result. <laughs> The first Italian vendor of hot drinks and cold ices in the Ronda was one Giulio Brachi. With a grace and economy typical of this bustling place, every subsequent Italian cafe was given the same name. I was born over the shop here, yeah? and if you can picture the scene, my father downstairs working behind the coffee machine, 
tanking of the old till and the, the coffee machine hissing away pss, all the time. And there's a shout upstairs, hey Serafino, your wife's just given birth to twin boys. So he rushed upstairs and brought us down and baptized us into the coffee machine. Mario and Aldo, in nomine patris filios santos. And I've been behind the counter ever since, and I think I'll be taken out from you when my day comes. If you spoke to anyone in the Ronda and you were going to a cappy, you weren't going to either Baquetas or Capininis or whatever the case may be, it was you'd be going to a Bracchi. The reason being is that Bracchi were the first Italians to open in the Ronda. They could see that there was this future for them and they became an integrated part of the community. It's an accepted thing that if you go into any small valley town, even today, you will find an Italian cafe. And I think we are very similar in, in a lot of ways. We, we enjoy conversation, we enjoy talking to each other, uh, we, we like the social aspect of life. I think the mountains attracted us as well because the area that we came from was a mountainous area, which is Bardi, where 90% of the Italians in the Ronda did, did originate. <laughs> 